is now on. And today is the hottest September on record. It's not even September anymore. It's hot. Uh, it is October 2nd, 2019. And this is Collin College. And this is ITSE 2309, database programming. Uh, let's see. And it has been my experience that students, that the day after a test is due uh, will be a day of light turnout, both uh, in person and uh, online. But we'll see uh, if a few more people show up. Um, okay, I have reopened stuff. Uh, please pay attention to me now. Don't email me assignments. If you're late on an assignment, um, I'm gonna, I'll reopen it and let you turn it in, but please stop emailing me assignments. There is nothing I can do with an assignment in my email. When you turn it to Canvas, it comes into, it comes in my grading inbox. Um, when I get one in an email, there's really nothing I can, well, I mean, I can get it to my grading inbox, but it involves several other steps and they come trickling into my uh, Colin College email and they're attached to my uh, 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 messages, Canvas messages, and they'll be attached in different file formats. Sometimes they'll be in text files and SQL files. Um, I need to have them in Canvas and preferably on time. Um, if I cut it off, everybody emails them to me and there's nothing that I can really do with them. Um, so what I've done is the time on it to give a few time, turn it in and get caught up. I get caught up, people. Um, or I don't know, if you have to drop, drop, but um, you, know, you should, talk to me about it, try coming to class. Uh, people will take this class, say this is a sophomore level class, it is a 2000 level class. It does not have a prerequisite on it, however the prerequisite is that you should be at the sophomore level, um, college sophomore level, and I, uh, there, there's no particular class that you have to take, but this shouldn't be your first programming, your first computer class. And for some people, it means it really is. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a way I can warn people about that, uh, particularly online students. Another thing I find that when I'm talking to online students and, and uh, I, Zoom, I say, well, turn to such and such page in your book, I've, I don't have a book. Well, yeah, you're probably lost if you don't have a book. Um, so, I don't know really what to say in online class because most of my students are online. Most of my students who signed up for this class do so online because that's the way things are going now. People want online classes. And we at uh, Collin College try to provide online classes. And I try to be available to online, but there's only so much I can do online. And if you get way behind, or a little bit moderately behind, that you're going to have to come to the lab and let me, let me help you. This is, why, this is why we have the online lecture, is so that I can help you. Uh, enough of that. Uh, I'm going to put out an announcement on the uh, uh, in the Canvas announcements on the, uh, that the, the, the locked assignments have been reopened. If you emailed me something, take it out, go get it and turn it in on Canvas because I really can't, I, I never get it uh, officially. It's not connected to my grade book. So if I, when I grade it, I put a grade in for it and then it in automatically goes back to you and shows up in your grades and in my grade book. Uh, if it comes in an email, I just don't have any of that, that easily to me. And it's really a pain in the neck. It's, it's set up nicely for, for grading if it comes in through the, through the normal turn-in method. But when they come in differently and all over the map, it's really a pain in the neck. The other thing I, I want to avoid and I will not be happy about is students will 
tend to give me all of their assignments on the last day of class. And I'm just swamped. I'm trying to get everything turned in and I still have stuff trickling in and people emailing them to me when I finally cut it off. So there's gonna be a cutoff on it. I'll tell you when it's gonna be when it's gonna cut off. Um and it, it'll be before uh it won't be on the last day of class. So don't think that you can go right up until uh the week and then turn everything in. Um that's that does not make your teachers happy. It does not make me happy. Okay, uh, that's enough of that. And how many people have I got here? Okay, any questions from uh, online pajaritos? Okay, pause for questions. Let's see, where are we right now? We are in, we are in module seven. And uh, module seven is chapter five. Um, and we're creating, let's see, we're using the aggregate functions. And the aggregate functions were, let's see, let me get back here into the module. Module seven. So the set operations, no, I don't want the set operations. I'm not doing a whole lot with the set operations that's union and intersect mostly and accept. I, I don't believe I'm giving a whole lot that, they're important, yes. Um, and a good programmer should know about them. Um, I, they, they are used kind of sparsely. Okay, SQL aggregate functions. The, um, these guys are count, sum, min, max, and AVG are the ones we are going to look at. There are five of them here. Yes, there are more. Uh, I can get a, um, I can take the average, I can get the uh, standard deviation, variance, some statistical functions. Um, uh, the other stuff I can do, product, factorial, um, but by and large, these are enough to show how they work. These are the ones that people are most familiar with. The count, how many, the add them up, the low, lowest value, the biggest value, and the average. So sum and AVG assumes that they have to be numbers. It only works on numbers. Min and max will work on numbers and it Min and max work on what we call scalar values. A scalar value is anything where one is greater than the other one. So some things are some things are scalar, i.e., a um, um, your name I can alphabetize, and somebody's name is greater than or less than somebody else's name or equal to. Uh, a digitized fingerprint does not have that. For example, a picture, and we can put pictures in the database. We just they're not very interesting to me. A count applies to anything. It's either not null or it's null. It's either, yeah, it's either, something's either there or not, and count counts anything that's there. There are others that say count uh, only if it's a number. So, and ignore it. So there are some variations on count. These five will be enough. These five are all we're gonna work with in in ours, okay? Um, And example. So let's see, I've covered a little bit of this. I talked about, well, let me let me do a little select. Do this one first. Count. So uh, count vendor ID. Now you remember that vendor ID is the primary key of uh, uh, so you can hold a little while.
Okay. Yeah. Uh, hold off on the printing for a minute. Um, look, uh, we need to become familiar with this uh, uh, object explorer here. If you close it down, and you may, you can exit out and, and close down the object explorer. And you can do control R and get more room on your screen. If you want that to come back, you go to view, view, object explorer, or you could just hit F8 and that would bring it back. And now it comes back under databases. You'll find your databases. There are several of them in here. And as you might see these, um, some of these others belong to the advanced class. is their database. Ours is either APDB or ScratchDB. ScratchDB could be anything you want to be a uh, junk database. AP is our production database. If I drop this guy down and I look at the tables, I want to see what are the table names. These are the table names that I have in my AP database. If I want to find out something about the vendors, I can drop it down and I can look at the columns. And there it shows me the primary key, um, vendor ID is a primary key, and it tells me that it's an integer and not null. Now don't pay a whole lot of attention to that not null or null because it might have a constraint on it that says it can't be null. So just because this thing is saying it can be null doesn't mean that it isn't constrained against null in the SQL that created it. So it, it's not null because it's primary key. The rest of these say null, 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 null. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Down here, we see that there is a foreign key into the vendor's table, the default account number. The rest of these, most of them are var char or char, couple of integers. Um, we can take a look at that. We can see the keys. So this shows me all the keys. We can see the constraints on the table. Notice that there are lots of constraints. I tend to use constraints fairly um, heavily. Uh, so I tend to put a lot of not null stuff on it. Don't worry about triggers or indexes or statistics at this point. So right now we're interested in the columns and maybe the keys columns are the big ones. So uh, if you want to find out what a column is named, go look up the table and go take a look at these columns instead of just trying to type it from memory. I always have to go look. And what the heck was the name of that anyway? Um, so select count vendor ID. Now vendor ID is the primary key of vendors. So if I say select count and I say execute that, I get 123. There are 123 vendors in my vendor ID table. Why do I know that? Because they everybody has to have a vendor ID. Okay. Uh, now here's where I can, by using my SQL correctly, I can make this a little bit more efficient. If instead of saying count vendor ID, it's a little bit like saying, okay, go in the room and give me a hint. Well, the SQL is stupid and I think you should have to count people's heads. I only need to count people because everybody has to have a head. Uh, can we really call them a person if they don't? So I'm going to say instead of saying count the primary key, that will make the system go in and find the primary key. So it has to go into the record and see if there's a primary key there. Well, we know there's a primary key there. I'm not interested really in counting the primary keys because I'm gonna get the same count as if I just said count any darn thing you see. Any record that's there, you count it. Doesn't matter what it is. Remember the asterisk is many times used as a wild card. Count anything. Okay. And so Let's see if what we've got here. If I run this, I'm expecting to get exactly the same count of 123, and bingo, I did. Okay. Um, I hear somebody clicking their microphone. 
Okay. Uh, so that's uh, whenever you're not interested in, in any particular thing, I don't want to count. If I'd said count, um, oh, let's see, what do we, what might we do here? Um, vendors. Uh, if I if I'm interested in how many of them do I have that have phones? Okay, I might have said something like this. Count how many do I have where there where there is a phone number, and I'm going to expect this to be less than the number that has a. So I only have 98 that really have phones, and that's something that I I want to know. Had I said count asterisk, I'd have gotten everybody. Uh, vendor ID, so we, we won't take the count of a primary key. If I'm interested in, because that's going to give me the count of the records, just say asterisk in there and get it all. That's cheaper for you. Okay, I'm going to select the vendor ID and the count. Now, what do I want here? If I say, uh, remember the new rule that I gave you last time when we were here just, I believe it was last week. I said, new rule. And who, what's that comedian that always says, new rule? Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. He's kind of vulgar sometimes, so I won't, I won't quote him often. Sometimes he uses some pretty foul language. Um, oh golly, I'll think of his name. Um, new rule. The, if you have an, a, an aggregate function, aggregate function, sum, count, min, max, AVG, and you have a, a field that is not an aggregate function, all of the fields, any of the fields, one or more of the fields must be part of a group by. Now let's look at what happens when I just say, if I say select these guys, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to execute it with just line 12 and 13 and see what happens without that. I get a red line. It says that invoice vendor ID is invalid in the, um, select line because it is not contained in either an aggregate function or the group by clause. So there's the, we've triggered the rule. Now I'm going to put it in the group by clause. I'm going to execute the whole thing. So now I have group by vendor ID. When I execute this, the vendor IDs all collapse. Every time the vendor ID changes in the invoices table, remember they don't have to be unique in the invoices table. Um, then had I had I put uh, had I said from the vendors table, I would have all gotten one 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 one. They'd all been ones, but in the in from the vendors table because everybody has a different vendor ID. But in the invoices table, the vendor IDs tend to tend to, to duplicate. For example, uh, uh, vendor ID thirty four, I have two of them. Vendor ID 37, I've got three of them. 48, I've only got one of him. Um, 95, I've got six of them, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, is it possible that I have zero of anything in the, in the invoices table? I think, you know, I have some vendor IDs that don't show up in the invoices table. I only got 34 rows. How many vendor IDs do I have in the, in the table, in, in the vendor's table? I have 123 vendor IDs in the, in the, in, in the vendor's table, but over here in the invoices table, as I look down here, at the bottom, over here in the bottom right corner, I see I only have 34 rows. So that means I have 34 different vendor IDs. By the way, that one right there, that 999 is an invalid one that I put in there. Um, why don't I see any with a count of zero? Why? Well, it doesn't appear in the vendor in, in the invoices table. I'm taking them from the invoices table, and if it's not in the invoices table, it doesn't get counted. 
if I wanted to get the, I, I would need an outer join. Okay, so I would need to get childless parents. By the way, I'm doing something bad here, and I didn't really mean to. I need to, as I need on all of these, anytime I'm using an aggregate function, and I'm just as bad about forgetting these as anybody else is, um, I need to name that aggregate function that count. So when I say count, I, I need to give it a name. Uh, some, I'll typically name it my count a lot. If you named it X, I would be perfectly okay with that. Um, I don't want to see no column name. X would be fine. So you can name it X, but don't just leave it unnamed. Okay, questions? Okay, here's the next topic that comes in this chapter, and this one gets kind of tricky. Where? Where? My count is greater than one. And I think you may notice here that there is a red squiggly on the where. Well, why would that be? Well, let's see, my count is declared up here on the select line, and we know that I can't use my count down there on the, um, on that. I'm sorry, you know, we don't even know what that is. So um, I can't, but what if I said this? What if I said where count asterisk is greater than one? Would I be able to get away with that? Okay. And no, I won't. Um, it's still giving me the same kind of a problem. Okay, here's the deal. Where, where, W-H-E-R-E, -E, applies to individual records. Okay, so it would make sense to say where, um, vendor ID, I meant to take that out, where vendor ID is greater than 50, that makes sense. Um, actually, I've got my group by in the wrong place. There, the group by comes last. So the group by comes at the very end. So now when I execute this, um, all of my vendor IDs, let's put an, well, actually group by comes at, after the where, but before the order by, so or, order by um, vendor ID. Make it easier to see. Now when I execute this, uh, 72, 80, 82, so these guys are all nicely ordered for me. Uh, vendor ID 123 has 47 invoices. Lots of them have it, but um, it doesn't, uh, if I say where, where applies to an individual record. Where vendor ID in an individual record is greater than 50. So the where applies to individual records. Important point, where applies to individual records. Where the vendor ID is greater than 50. Where the vendor ID is not null. Um, probably, probably won't have any where it, where it's, where it is null. Um, what else would be there? Where the invoice total is greater than 1,000. Where the balance due. If you calculate, remember the, uh, uh, we had a calculated the balance due a lot in, in one of them. So where that calculation is greater than 1000 or something like that. Um, 
Now, when I have something that applies to the group, the group is not uh, handled in the where. The where is individual records. Okay, so let me put that out there. Individual. Individual records group by vendor ID. I'm going to tab this one over. I will usually tend to put both of these on the same line because I think of them as coming together. Having, having applies to the group. So having, um, I think I can use my count. I, I might be doing something wrong. I'm going to say my count no, it's not letting me do that. Okay, so I'll just have to say count. Having count greater than one. Okay, so now I, so the count applies to groups. Where applies to individual records. Having applies to the groups. And here in all its glory, we have the select from where statement. Uh, there aren't any more lines coming. The first line that gets executed, so let me put these in order for you. First line is the from. Second line is the where. The third line is the group by having. The fourth, almost the last line is the select, is which, which fields do we want to see? And that's order by. So I could, it would make sense to say that. I could say order by my count because my count has already been done, but the order by is the last one that is, is done. So there's the order that, the, that they happen in. So if I declare an uh, alias, and I can do that, I can, I can alias the table, and, and I do that on. Um, when I'm joining tables, um, okay. So when I execute this, well, I see only where the count is greater than one. Everything is ordered by the vendor ID. I see no vendor IDs less than or equal to 50 because that's in the where clause. Um, questions. Now, uh, adding to all of this, and in, in each of these, we have the um, we we have table joins and all. So I select vendor ID uh, from invoices. Let's see. Suppose I wanted to throw a curve here, and instead of just the vendor ID, I want you to see the I want to see instead of vendor ID, I want to see their name. Oh, now we're gonna we're gonna really throw a hitch into your get along. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the same thing, but remember the where applies to individual records, the having applies to the groups. So I only want to see groups where the count is greater than one. And here I want to see, instead of the vendor ID, I want to see the vendor name. Okay, what's the problem? I'm getting a little red squiggly that says there's an error there, which is, oh, it's fairly good. It doesn't always tell you the truth. Sometimes that thing will flag an error that's not really an error, but it's really an error this time. Why is that thing giving me a hard time? 
because you say what? I've, I've got my headphone. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Say. There's nothing as vendor name in the invoices table. Yes, thank you very much. And Invo vendor name is in what table? Well, let's see. Let's let's go. Yeah, you're you are correct. It's in the vendors table. I'm gonna open the object explorer and go check that. And make sure vendors table. Yes, there's vendor name right there. In the okay. So vendor name from invoices. And anytime I'm doing the the join, I'm gonna close him down and get some more space here. Might blow up my font a little bit for y'all. Uh, from invoices, anytime I do a join, I will almost almost always just because I love to type so well. I will almost always alias the tables. I usually will put the parent table on the left. But that's just a matter of style. It doesn't matter. Put them in any order you want. Um, and then, since I'm doing the, uh, we will almost always from now on use the uh, newer syntax. I used to teach the older one more, but I don't so much anymore. Uh, so uh, I will use the inner join. Um, and I should, I don't know why I put it like that. Okay. And as I pointing out that the term inner is optional in most platforms, but not in this class. So I don't want to see from vendors as V join invoices. Yes, that would give you an inner join. And in most platforms it'll work, but it won't work in here. When you get into the, if you decide to take my advanced class, you get to do that but <laughs> until then uh, on. Okay, so what's the primary key? The primary key of uh, vendors is vendor ID, so where v dot vendor ID equals i dot vendor ID, and I can get away with that. Oops, somebody come in. So I can get away with that only because the um, okay. Why is he? Why is he still red? Ah. Uh, Okay, vendor ID here, I'm, I'm gonna have to specify which one I'm interested in, which table, because vendor ID is in both tables. So I'll have to say either v.vendor ID or i.vendor ID. When I do that, I will typically um, uh, use the, the parent table. I could use either one. Uh, group by vendor name. Uh, again, if I really want to order by vendor ID, um, oh, let's just get cute here. And instead of let's let's order by my, I will be al allowed to put my count in the order by line um, because that's the last one that happens. So it'll, uh, that'll be fine. When I execute this, I see them now ordered by that. Um, let's see. Uh, looks like they're ordered by vendor name just by default, but um, that doesn't mean anything. Since I didn't say order by uh, my count comma, vendor name, I can't count on them being ordered by vendor name. They just happen to be ordered by vendor name. Uh, you have to be careful with that in your, um, in your programs. Okay. That if you expect it to be ordered and you're using the fact that it's ordered in your output, you have to say order by. 
um, in the uh, the as is optional as is optional here it's optional here optional not in this class um, enter the word enter is optional that's about it but I want to see it I want to see the full syntax in here for for, for right now questions okay the where okay if I ask you only to show groups with certain properties that's in the having statement so group by having you never have a having without a group by having does not appear without group by at all therefore when I write group by and whether I have a having or not if I do have a having I just put it up on that same line as the group by so I say group by space having count. So the way I would have done this is I would have put the, the having up like that. That would have been my, my idea of formatting it. Um, it's kind of your call if, if you want to if you want to drop it down to the second line I think I would probably indent it when I indent something like that I'm saying it's really part of the line above it uh, so I I can't have inner join without an on these these two lines go together they're locked together and if I use this if I put it down as a second line by indenting it I'm saying that these two lines are together they're not independent and I can't move them around so that's pretty much in all of its glory now there is the um, uh, aggregate function and we finally gotten all of the lines we're going to get in an SQL statement. Well, yeah, it's going to get more complicated, but for right now, at least we don't get any more lines like group buys. So the group buys, but they're really not that difficult. You just have to remember that when you say group by, well, when when you say count or sum or AVG, you have an aggregate function. If you have an aggregate function, and I have an aggregate function, uh, so I want the vendor name and the count of something. Well, what do I want the count of? Obviously, I want the count of the vendor name. What I'm saying is that all of the vendor names are going to have to collapse into one, wh where they are equal, they have to collapse. If I have group by two things, and typically you don't, well, you can, of course. So I could group by vendor name, comma, vendor city, or something like that. It would be possible. So here I want the vendor names and the vendor city, so where either of those change. So if I had two vendor names that were the same, and one of the cities was different, they would be a different group. Uh, group by last name. Everybody's last name is going to get scrunched into uh, everybody whose last name is Jones is going to appear in one group. So I might have 50 records. All of them have last name of Jones. If I said group by last name, comma, first name, then everybody whose last name was Jones was Tom Jones would be a group and everybody whose la whose name was Sally Jones would be a group. Okay. What time are we? 11:38. Okay. Well. And then finally the 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 so the group by anytime I have the two together an aggregate function and a function that is not aggregate for example vendor name and count it works the same way if I have three of them um, I really should it'd be nice if I let me see do I have access on here I might uh, I might put access I might do a few um, queries in access for you uh, just to show you that access also reads SQL uh, you have an SQL view on it. it's a little strange looking um, but I could pick this up this query 
pick it up and paste it into Access, and it would run just fine. Uh, if I let Access do it, it's going to look a little strange. But if I were just to pick this up and paste it into Access's SQL, um, it's going to be it, it'll, it'll run, given that the tables exist. Um, okay, and maybe I'll go ahead and create these tables over there just so I can bring it in and, and show you. You know, Access is same thing. And once you say when once you go into a query and put a an aggregate function like a count, a sum, a min, or a max in there, the rest of them automatically go to group by. And so that confuses students a lot because they'll put a, a count in there and then they have five or six other fields in there and they're grouping by all of those other fields and they're wondering why they always just get count one, count one, count one, count one. Well, because they're grouping by the primary key. It doesn't make any sense, for example. This makes no sense. Select. So, because look at this, it says, uh, since I have, a, I have an aggregate function and I have a non-aggregate function, everything in the non-aggregate function has to be, must be a group. So I say group by vendor ID, and I'm gonna put a little tag out here on this one. This makes no sense. Why doesn't this make any sense? What am I gonna get? When I run this, all I'm gonna see is ones. I'm gonna get all 123 rows. I'm gonna get 123 groups. I can go through and look at all these wonderful groups I have, but how many, uh, why, why am I getting my count of one on all of them? Because every place that the vendor ID from vendors, vendor ID, is a primary key, uh, the primary key of vendors. Everybody has to have one. It has to be different for everybody. Therefore, it's always going to be one. Uh, so, and I, I can't not have it. Um, it's got to be there. And so, th this that that whole query makes no sense at all. It's a, I'm just, I'm wasting my time putting count. All I'm going to see is one. Uh, it makes no sense at all to group by a primary key. Um, now, I can group by a foreign key. Right? Uh, so if I were selecting from um, invoices, that's going to change things a lot. So if I if I'm selecting now from invoices to this, uh, now it makes a little more sense because now the counts can be um, I'm I'm grouping by the foreign over there in invoices. So vendor ID is a foreign key there. That makes more sense. So I might want to group by saying how are these uh, foreign keys? How many foreign keys do I have? Okay. But when it's when I'm saying vendors, that's just just say just say select vendor ID vendors, then you can you get the same thing. Okay, questions. Um Uh, but there are two two different things I guess I ought to mention at this time. If you talk about count, we have all and distinct. Um, if you say count all, um, 
it considers duplicates to be two different values. And if we say count distinct, it only counts different ones. So if I say count all of the um, invoices, let me uh, show them. Um, let me see if this will count. Uh, let's change this to invoices. Okay, count all. Um, this one gave me the 34 rows. And if we change it a little bit, and instead of saying count all, we say count distinct. This is gonna change it slightly. No, I guess it didn't. Um, Uh, let's see, what can I, pardon me, uh, how can I show this? I'm trying to get something here, select, um, what do I have over there in invoices that I can use? Columns. And we'll try invoice date. Change it to invoice date. This one. Okay, so we're going to count all of the invoice dates. Uh, and of course, we have to group by invoice date since it's selected. And let's see what we get here. I get 73 rows. Um, I, and here I'm going to say count distinct. Um, and let's see how it changed. I might not get any difference because um, uh, it might be counting the time with it. And let's see if that changes anything. Still getting the same thing. Uh, count all, we don't, I don't use this a whole lot, count all and count distinct, but when you use count all, um, uh, it considers duplicates as two different values. So if I had two that were the same, uh, it, it would just be one of them. On the other hand, excuse me, that would be two. So if I were counting last names and I had two people named Smith, um, and I count all, that would just be one count. If I said count distinct, that would be two. Okay. Count all says count duplicates as a different entity. Count distinct says collapse duplicates. So if I want to see how many, um, um, here, oh, I, I know a good example. Um, select count count all vendor ID from invoices. So this one, if I say count all vendor IDs from invoices, I'm going to expect to see um, 
Okay, 114. Um, versus count distinct vendor ID. Let me see what happens here. That one I say, okay, so if I count all, there, this is a good example. If I count all of the vendor IDs, how many vendor IDs, in other words, how many rows since I have a vendor ID on every row, uh, I think I have one. When I execute that, I get 114 rows. But when I count the distinct vendor IDs, how many different ones do I have in there? I only get 34 rows. So I have 114 rows of vendor IDs on them. So count all says, you know, if I have duplicate vendor IDs, that's two records or three records or 10 records. Uh, if I have duplicate vendor IDs and I'm saying count distinct, the duplicates collapse. So it's a little bit like a group by. Many times I, I'll use this instead of a group by. I don't do that very much. I, I can usually accomplish the same thing with group by. Um, we're about to a break. Um, next. Group by, group by having. Okay, I'm going to make the assignment. And let's see. Okay, I'm not putting the cutoff dates right at this time. I will, we're going to have a cutoff date. I've got it due on October 9th. That's pretty good. I expect you to get them in about that due date. Um, if not, you'll be behind and we don't want to do that. So I'm making the due date. I'm not gonna cut it off. Uh, if you have sent me anything in email, uh, go get it back and turn it in via Canvas. If you need to turn in anything, go ahead, turn it in. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a break. Questions uh, on, uh, on the uh, remote people? Martin, you doing okay? Amanda, Ms. Parks, anybody may speak? Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to, where am I going from here for the modules? The next one that I'm going to bring up is, and I'm going to continue this today. I'm going to go into module eight, chapter six. Um, you need to do chapter seven first. So we'll do chapter six and that's subqueries. And this is, the, there's, there's kind of a break right here after chapter seven. So uh, I'm going to pause my, okay, somebody's chatting. Could you repeat the rule for aggregate functions? Uh, yes, uh, Daniel. Um, by the way, it's okay to send private, but that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're sending in a, a class setting, it probably won't stay private. So um, the aggregate functions are, uh, there are five of them we're going to consider, and that is count, min, max, sum, and AVG average. And the rule is, if you have an aggregate function on the line, then that's fine. So if I say, you know, select count of um, um, vendor ID, I'm going to see how many vendor IDs I have in there. They'll all collapse, and I'm going to get one answer. If I put anything else on the line besides the vendor ID, or be, excuse me, besides the count, and uh, here's the example is right here. Um, there's count vendor ID. I'm just going to, all this is going to show me is how many different ones do I have in there. So I've got 123 different vendor IDs and vendors. Um, and if I say count the vendor phones, this tells me how many non-null vendor phones, so I have 98 of those. As soon as I put something else in there, so this one, it says I have, I have a aggregate function, count, 
and I have a non-aggregate function. Now I must have the group by. So the vendor ID, anything that is not a part of an aggregate function must be grouped by. Okay, these two go together. We can't change them. Now I don't have to have this. The having count greater than one isn't required. But if I, if I select the, and the where is not required. And the order by is not required. I guess I'll leave it in there. I just So these are the three right there that I really need. And I'll go ahead and leave the order by in there. It just puts some order onto it. Now, notice that as, as I the vendor IDs change, the counts change. So all of vendor ID 34 collapsed into one count. Um, vendor 95, I have six records. Some of them I have, vendor 123, I have 47 records. So if I try it without that, if I try it just to, to, do, to run it without the group by, I get an error message and it says it's invalid because it is not contained in a group by. So this guy, if I have something that is an aggregate function, aggregate and non-aggregate, the non-aggregates all have to be contained in a group by. Doesn't matter whether you have one or ten. Did I get your question? Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to take a short. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who are hanging around, or if you're if you're on campus, I see they've got free food out in the quadrangle. I might, out in the quad, I might step out and see if I can get something to eat. Anyway, I'm going to take a short break. It is 11.56. I am going to continue. And so I'm pausing the recording now. I'm resuming recording now. Um, Okay, what do I have that's a nice terms ID? Okay, invoices, terms ID. See what I've got over here. Select. Let's see what I've got in that table. Okay, ones and twos and threes and fours, two and four. Okay. Um, so select, let's try this. Select vendor ID from invoices where Terms ID equals two or and I guess I ought to look at the terms ID to make sure I'm getting them. So we're going to select the vendor ID and the terms ID from invoices uh, where the is a two or a four. I'm expecting this to execute okay. And so, so there's the twos and the fours, um, and that's all I've got is, and there is two and four. I could say order by, let's um, put the order by on it. To make it obvious if we're getting anything except twos and fours. And there's all my twos followed by all of my fours and Okay, life is fine. So I'm selecting uh, uh, terms ID is a number. Uh, it's a number one, two, three, or four uh, are, the, are the terms. And I can go over to the terms table and see what that means. Um, and that's, it tells you over there. So if we wanted to go see it, um, I could rewrite this query as
where terms ID in open parentheses two comma four close parentheses. Okay, now that's a set and I'm saying where the terms ID is in there. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to get the same the same question, the same answer, same 26 um, rows. Uh, so it's they they are essentially saying the same thing. Why is one why is one of them any better than the other? Well, they're not. You could write it either way, and and particularly there are usually about 20 or 30 different ways to write the same query or the, a query that gives you the same output. So this is just one example. Where this is commonly used um, is when I want to find, so find uh, invoice with max uh, invoice total. All right. So I want to find the maximum. Now I could say I could just do that easily and say select um, max invoice total, and that would be fine. That would give me the number. Um, but I'd be interested in you know, the invoices, and I want to know the invoice ID that has that maximum and I, there might be ties. I don't know whether it's going to be, it'll be at least one. One will be maximum, assuming that I have any in the table. Now, if I don't have any in the table, I'm gonna get a null answer, of course. But if I have at least one in the total in, in the table, I'm gonna have a max. So I can say select um, invoice ID. And voice total from uh, this is an important thing to watch here where invoice total now I'm going to use the in operator in and this is the way I usually format it I usually press enter open parentheses. Notice when I said in up here, the parentheses were required. I can't drop those. So I have them here also. Now I tab over, select max, No semicolon at the end of that query, but a semicolon goes at the end of the outer query. Now, notice what this, what's going on here. I have two queries that are working together to give me this answer. I don't know how many uh, of, the, of these guys in invoice ID will satisfy this, that their invoice total will be in this select maximum invoice total. I don't know how many. But when I execute this, if there are any duplicates, um, and I did not get any duplicates, but the, the maximum invoice total is $37,966.96. If I have any duplicates, and I could go in and put one in, um, and I, I don't think I will, but if I, if I had duplicates there, I would, I would have multiple rows in this output. So I would record ties for the highest. Um, let me see, what do I have? That, um, invoice date. Um, 
columns. Edit top two. Let's look at these invoice dates. Yeah, I think maybe if, if I say uh, invoice total, if I change that instead of total, I want the highest invoice date. Invoice where invoice date is in. Now Max will work on date. And this one can be invoice date. Uh, now I hope I get some duplicates here. And okay. Let's instead of max, let's try min. See if I get any minimums, minima. And well, I'm not getting any duplicates. I was hoping to get some duplicates. Um, Well, terms ID would work. Um, there's only four different values for those, so I'm bound to hit a few duplicates. So if I say select the minimum, I got a feeling that's gonna be one, and I'm gonna get a whole bunch of those. Uh, so uh, terms ID of one, I've got all the guys. And if I change it to max, so this is handy if I want to know uh, who has the highest score, but I'm also willing to accept having multiple people with the highest score, and I want to see all of them. Now, uh, why is this so important? Um, the reason this is important is it demonstrates the first idea of the subquery. Notice that I have this outside query running, and where, the where is where it's in, and it's just like this where terms ID is in to comma four. This one says where it's in, and this one says select the max. Now, you notice that I do have an aggregate function here. I have a, uh, a group by. Now, there's kind of a group by running. There's, um, um, and I, I, I could have written it with a group by, but it's a whole lot easier to write it like this. So I say select the invoice ID and the terms ID from invoices, and then check to see that the terms ID is in this. Give me the very common way to do this. Uh, and it's, um, most of the time, anytime I'm trying to find a maximum and a minimum where I might have ties for the maximum or the minimum or the average, you know, what's, what's the average, um, you know, how many people are average? So if, if I were to that, um, let's see. It's kind of a fun exercise here. Anybody here that's average? There was a movie once about, well, I am average. I'm just like everybody else and nobody else was average except he was. So that would be a very unaverage person. Um, let's see, so I could select invoice ID. Um, invoice total from invoices where invoice total is in select max invoice total so this is the one that we've already seen work and this gives us back the maximum guy what about average what if we wanted to get the average invoice total. Who is average? Well, do I have anybody that's average? Suppose I change that from max, I change that to AVG. I'm going to be very surprised. Um, 
I'm not going to get anybody. Why? Because nobody is average. Okay. Now, what am I willing to call average? How will I say that you're average or not? I don't know whether I should get bogged down in that. So where average invoice total, so this is, is the, um, oh, let's see, I'm gonna be here working on this one for a while. I'm gonna put this one on hold and I'm gonna come back to it because I'm gonna say, okay, I'm going to accept it if it's within 10%. And you'll be thinking about that and say, how can I say I want invoices where the invoice total is within 10% of this? In other words, plus or minus 10%. So I'm going to have to have where it is greater than this one, minus 10% and less than this one, plus 10%. So it gets a little tricky. I don't want to get lost and bogged down into that. Let's go over here and look at the subqueries and the uh, uh, introduction to subqueries. This is, I believe I've got, uh, yes, here is um, uh, Dr. King's lecture on it. And I do, I do like his lectures. Um, he talks about joins and subqueries. And for the most part, I can write just about any join. And I say just about any table join, I can write as a subquery. Just about any table join, I can write as a subquery. Um, take about, think about this query right here. Select. Um, let's see, what is this? Uh, what tables are needed? So chapter four, we have a childless parent query. Select vendor name. Let's see, what is this? Um, all of the vendors who have no invoices. Remember that? So all of vendors with no invoices. And let's take a look at him. So this is a childless parent query. I put the parent on the left as I usually do, but I could have put the parent on the right and made a right outer join. And I'm going to get all of the, all of the childless parents, all of the vendors who have no invoices, and I have 90 parents, 90 vendors with no pen. That's a lot of them. Okay, now I can write also as a subquery. I'm pointing that out here. I can change that. look like this, select vendor name from vendors where vendor ID is not in, select vendor IDs from invoices. Now, in my opinion, this one is pretty straightforward. This one makes a whole lot of sense to me that they would be the same thing. So one of them uses an outer join and the other one uses a subquery. Okay, there's the there's the outer join. So the outer join, vendor name, vendors, left outer join invoices. It's pointing at vendors. So I'm going to get everything from vendors on join field where the vendor ID, where the right side is null. So this can give me anybody with, with no children. Straightforward, less parent query. Basically, the exact same thing can be realized through a subquery. So just select vendor name from vendors, where vendor ID is not in. Okay, now when can I do this? When does it make sense to switch between one and the other? There is something about this query that I'm trying to get here that tends to steer me towards a subquery. I would write it as a subquery. I like subqueries better than table joins. The only reason I did table joins first is because table joins came first in the book and I'm trying to stick with the same sequence. I am following the book um, fairly closely, believe it or not. And I, I do that. I, I, I don't sit here and read you the book. Uh, I do expect you to be reading the book. Um, 
but we are we are following chapter by chapter through it and the thing that would lend me to this the thing that would cause me to say aha that's a subquery is check this the everything i need comes from one table everything i need comes from one table Every output comes from one table. Now, just because everything in the output does not come from one table does not mean I cannot use a subquery. But when everything I need in my output does come from one table, I get all fuzzy and warm feeling about using a subquery on it. Because to me, it is obvious that that is this code that I'm pointing to up here with my mouse is obvious. I want vendor name. What do I want? Vendor name. Anything else from the vendor's table. Uh, so I can give you the vendor name. I can give you the vendor ID. I can give you the vendor state, city, all that jazz. It's easy. As long as I'm, it gets a little trickier when I need something from the invoices table or a different table, then I'm going to have to have a table join in there someplace. And usually in that case, trying to do it with a subquery just adds complexity to it. Um, so if I've got to do a table join, if I, if I have to take something from both the vendor's table and the invoice table, if it's coming from both tables, I will typically think in terms of a table join. But since it's childless parent, well, it doesn't make any sense to take anything from the from the invoices table. They're all going to be null. So uh, this and childless parent table <coughs> queries, to me, lend themselves very clearly to a um, to a subquery. So this is the subquery where vendor ID is not in this table. Now, I could just as easily do a table join uh, where it is in the table, uh, and I could get them as long as everything is coming from one table. I really, really like subqueries. All of my output comes from one table. I am I'm gonna reach for a subquery first and somebody is asking a question. Go ahead. Uh Amanda. Uh does that mean that self joins would rarely if ever be used? Um there are certainly times to use self joins. Um <clears throat> I would use a self join i have a, i guess i'd never brought the example in i meant to of an employee's table where the supervisor was also an employee so when i'm i related uh, self join i'm looking for pairs um i want to find pairs of employees that all live in the same city for example i think that's one of our examples so find pairs of employees that live in the same city. Now, the tricky part about this is that if, uh, uh, if you and I both live in Denton or Plano or uh, McKinney, wherever we live. So if I live in Frisco and Amanda lives in Frisco, then you would get Stephen and Amanda would be a pair but so would amanda and stephen and the other point is that amanda lives in the same city as amanda so when you table join like that you're going to get some extra stuff that you know that's going to show up so everybody lives in the same city as themselves well i could change that let me let me do a quick uh self join since that has come up the 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 classic example of a self join select um and one i'm going to have to rename the
Vn2. Well, and the dot. And you'll see why I'm naming stuff here in just a second. So I've renamed the, the tables. One. So here I have a self join. So the ta the two tables are joined. The vendors table is joined with the vendors table. No, V one vendors equals. Now, I don't know why you would want pairs of people who live in the same city. Um, about to get it. I'm expecting this to run. And let's see what I get. Um, uh, let's see. I got 1,899 rows here. And it's quite a, a few, but let's take a look at it. The well, U.S. Postal Service lives in the same space the postal service and more than that I have two or three uh, US and, and then US Postal Service in the same city as US Postal Service so I'm getting a lot of duplicates here so I can suppress some of those duplicates like where um, v1 the name is equal uh, v2 dot vendor name and this will suppress quite a few of them now I'm down to 74 rows um, so the national information and the register of copyrights so notice that I've got this guy and somewhere in here I will have the register of copyrights backwards so there's national information data center register of copyrights register of copyrights and the national information data center so they are backwards okay how can i fix that instead of not equal to i can change it to where the first one is less than a single so now if i execute this i now get 887 rows um, and now I'm getting more what we want. So job track and OPAMP technical books are share a city. Job track and Office Depot share a city. Um, I should not get Office Depot and job track. Um, so basically I'm putting them together, but this is giving me pairs that live in the same city. So um, got quite a few of them in Fresno. Um, if I were to add in the city, I would be able to see the, the cities that we're talking about here, but I've got quite a bit, few people that live in Fresno. So if, um, if there's three of us that live in the same city, then, Uh, people in the same city as Stephen. Bob lives in the, in the same city as Bill. Bill lives in the same city as Stephen. Let's see. Bob. And the same city as no. I'm going to get four or five. I'm going to get some duplicates in there. So the more I get, I'm going to get every possible permutation of them. So I have to do a lot of thinking about this and how well I, um, you know, stop them from from getting all of those duplicates i've got i probably have it down about as low as i can get it because i'm requiring that vendor one name be less than vendor two name um so as i get down towards the end here 
Um, let's order by. Um, order by V1. And see how this looks. So, well, it looks like I'm getting all of these are valid. So these are all the valid 887 valid pairs of uh, vendors out of 123 rows, I think. 887 pairs live in the same city. Um, and so that would be like if, um, if we had five people and we all lived in the same city, then one lives in the same city as two and three and four and five. Two lives in the same city as three, four, five. Three lives in the same city as four and five. Four lives in the same city as five. Um, so we're gonna get quite a few uh, permutations there. Um, that we can that we can use, and so that goes to the. Uh, I don't know. I guess I've uh, to answer your question. We use a self join when we're looking for pairs that are in the same in in the same table, and this is an example of it that was given in the uh, textbook was finding pairs of of uh, vendors that live in the same city. And I think the smallest number we're going to get is about that 887. The trick to getting it is in the where line. So we have to join on the set, the cities being equal. And in the where line, I have to set, um, limit it to where one of them is less than the other one uh, to eliminate duplicates and el to eliminate backwards pairs. So if A lives in the same city as B, I don't want to see this, the, uh, the row B and A. I only want to see that one row. And I think that's about the least I'm going to get. So these are all valid pairs. I don't know, did I, is that more answer than you really wanted? I was just checking to see if the other um, query, the inner queries were would be able to do the same thing, basically. You mean using a um, using a, 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 a subquery? Yes. I would use inner join on this one. You, you could do. I'm going to talk a lot more about subqueries, um, and they're really powerful for some things, and they can get tedious on others. And for a self join. I would use an inner join. Okay. Um, okay. There's usually ways you can do it either way. Let me see. What time is it? It's 1244. I want to see am I. Okay, uh, some points about this guy. The syntax requires the parentheses here. Um, some people, including your professor, believes that a subquery is sometimes more intuitive than an outer join. Most of the time when I'm doing an outer join, I can do it in a subquery. Most of the time, I will reach for the subquery. In general, a subquery is neither more nor less efficient than a table join. The same amount of work, either way you do it, it's just whichever one you like better, unless I tell you to do one or the other, in case you gotta do one. You know, when we're in the book, when we're in the part about table join, uh, or subqueries, I want you to do subqueries. Um, Professor King raised a good point. Do not use the distinct keyword in the subquery. In a, in a set, because this is a set. So you would not say select distinct vendor ID. Uh, even though it would make that subquery smaller, it would cause your um, system to have to do more work just because of the, 
the way it is. It's either in the set or it's not, and you don't have to say distinct. Um, actually makes the query less efficient if you use that. But if you want to use a, in, uh, when, when you're writing a, a particular an outer join, if you want to use a subquery as opposed to an outer join, it's just a matter of which you like. And what I, the, the thing that would cause me to go one way or the other would be, I would look at it and say, aha, everything I want comes from one table. So if I were, if, if this were a question of find the vendor names and their associated invoice IDs, well, I wouldn't have any if it were an outer join, but if it were an inner join and I wanted vendor names, pairs, and nulls, so an outer join, but I, I want to get everybody in it, um, I would probably go with the table join if I had stuff taken from both tables. Because since I'm taking, taking output from both tables, I'm going to have to have a join in there. Don't have any way around it. So then if I'm trying to do a join and a subquery, um, well, sometimes I do that. But right now, I would like to avoid that. So the thing that's going to cause me to reach for the subquery is going to be, do I see everything coming from one table? Let me go and see what's coming up next. We're just about out of time here. Subqueries. This is the um, max So vendor ID invoices. So find the vendor ID. From invoices. Notice everything comes from one table, from from invoices table. Anytime I'm there. What if I? Uh, so here we are wanting the invoice total. Okay. Um, I'll let you take. I'll let you review this. Uh, it is just about 12:50. So I'm not going to start. Here's where we will start on. Uh, Next Wednesday, I pointed out, let me re reiterate what I said earlier. I have opened the um, uh, late assignments to be, to for turn in. Um, do not email me assignments. I went on and on about that at the beginning and says, you know, don't email me assignments there. Um, I need to get them in my canvas in order to be able to deal with them appropriately. So they never get in my queue for grading. And since I can, I can have your assignment, but I, it's difficult for me to enter a grade for you. Whereas if they come in in my canvas queue for grading, I just open them and enter your grade right there. Um, and then if you need to redo them, you need to resend them. Um, Anyway, that's, uh, like I say, I've, I've reopened them. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't found a good way to get people to turn stuff in. I've tried lots of different ways in my teaching career. I have tried, um, I've tried being a jerk. That doesn't seem to help a whole lot. Um, <laughs> I've tried, I've tried a carrot and stick approach with a, a um, contract. I said, okay, which would you take? Uh, would you rather have, you know, two points or 10 points or whatever it is for assignment you turn in on time? And for each assignment that is late, I deduct five points or two points or 10 points, whatever it is. Or would you prefer me just to say, hey, you know, get the stuff in. Uh, you're not in high school and I'm not your parent. Uh, which do you think people would choose? You said what? The second one. You'd say the second one. In other words, you get it, turn it in whenever you feel like it, huh? What do you guys online think? Would you rather have uh, Would you rather have a contract where I I gave you points for turning in stuff on time and took points if it were late, or would you rather me just not bother you? Somebody's sending me a message.
you take the extra 10 points, Amanda says. And, okay. Um, yeah, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, uh, people choose the uh, extra 10 points. Now, usually when I ask that, people say, oh, uh, you know, I'd like that, but I think most people would choose the, um, uh, you know, just don't bother me. Uh, I'm not in high school, and I'll turn it in when I get it done. Um, no, that, that isn't what ha happened. People will, I mean, most of the time, people will take the, uh, the points or points deducted if it's late. Uh, it doesn't change their behavior any. Problem with it is it just kills all their grandparents. Uh, and I end up being the, the cop in the deal. And so I'm trying to come up with a way that I can uh, handle it appropriately without uh, without it making me be the one to sit here and arbitrate over, you know, is your excuse good enough? Did you, did you, <laughs> are you crying about it? Um, I don't know. I guess when I was in college, I did quite a bit of crying too. I heard the story we had at University of Texas. We had a story about the person who got his leg put in the cast um, or bought the material and put his leg in a cast and walked around the rest of the semester with his leg in a cast uh, because he missed a test or something. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like an urban myth to me. Uh, I'll let you know when the deadline is coming up. I need you guys to get caught up, please. Pretty please. So catch up. Uh, get your stuff turned in, and if you're late, you, you don't have to give me any excuses. Just turn it in. All right. Well, it is 12.50, and I'm going to pause the recording.